So we're going to do a, an intro to the different types of astrophotography. Um, this is a shot. This is one of the first successful shots that I that I took, and uh, it's a big bright. That's a lagoon nebula, and it's a big bright target. It's uh, easy to to photograph, relatively speaking. The only challenge is it's kind of low on the southern horizon, uh, which uh, makes it hard to uh, auto guide. And we'll we'll get into that. But anyway, that's you know when I got a result like that, that's when I was really uh, suckered in. <laughs> So, and then that's the, the bigger picture that I just showed you that, that slice out of. So anyway, in this talk, we'll talk about the different types of astrophotography. And in each case, we'll talk about some of the gear that you need, the hardware, the software, some techniques that'll help you, and then uh, where you might get some, some resources. And jump in with questions anytime. Uh, so this... The first thing is just camera and a tripod, and we're, we'll call those nightscapes. And here's an example by a club member, and he's uh, got a blog, uh, Mark, and uh, you can read about how he took that shot, and you can read about his journey in astrophotography uh, on his, his blog there. Um, but this, this is the most accessible. To uh, daytime or terrestrial photographers because it's just a, a camera and a tripod. Um, we'll keep coming back to this topic of prime lenses. So a prime lens is a lens that's not zoom. It's a fixed focus. And in general, they're going to perform better for pinpoint stars than uh, zoom lenses. And you can save a lot of money by going and getting an old used prime lens because nobody wants them anymore except nighttime photographers uh, and they can be manual because you don't actually want them to be autofocus or any of that stuff so that's a good way good way to go um, so uh, if you want to buy them from a company uh, Adorama uh, B&H uh, who else Pretty much all the big camera stores have a used section, so you can do that, or you could do eBay if you're a little more trusting, or you know. And then there's for for all kinds of astro stuff. There's uh, Cloudy Nights has classifieds, Cloudy Nights website, and then uh, Astro Mart is another is another one. Okay, uh, yeah, I've I've got a whole collection of uh, used lenses from. Um, I think eight millimeters out to a thousand millimeters uh, that I've collected. So one of the challenges that that you'll have is how do you get in focus? It's dark. Your autofocus isn't going to work. So we'll talk about that. And uh, the other thing is if you're going to be leaving your camera out uh, to take long exposures at night, you have to think about dew control. So this is where. Uh, moisture condenses on on your lens. Uh, the first time I put my my camera out to do a time lapse overnight, and I came out in the morning and it was completely covered with dew. And when I made the time lapse, you know, it just gradually grayed out as the dew condensed. So that was kind of bummer. But um, so we'll talk about what you do about that. There's a thing called the rule of 500 that'll help you figure out how long you can expose without getting star trails. Assuming you don't you don't want star trails, and uh, you know you can shoot as uh, high an ISO uh, as you as you want, um, you know, but you ha there's a trade-off between noise and uh, the the ISO. So we'll talk about that. So there's one site here. Uh, there's you know tons and tons of sites on the web about how to do nightscapes. Yeah, I'll, yeah, I'll put a link up. So the next uh, thing we talked a little bit about about time lapse, right? So then you take a bunch of those pictures, and then uh, you can use some software to make it into a movie. Um, so it's kind of the next level of detail and, and cost. This is just one one example here. That's not a club member, but just one I found. Um, so the the 
software I recommend for this is kind of uh, expensive because you need both Lightroom and something called LR Time Lapse. But if you go to this LR Time Lapse website, uh, the guy is really good at uh, demos and has gone all over the world, both he and his wife, and taken some amazing time lapses and developed this software at the same time. So I recommend that. And uh, so that. Uh, you know, if, you're, if your camera's uh, steady, then this, this is what you're going to see. You can uh, get a tracker uh, so that the landscape moves, but you're tracking the stars. Or you could get, uh, you know, a motorized track or something where your camera moves to make more dynamic, you know, as the night goes on kind of thing. So there's lots of foreground lighting. There's lots of things you can do to make it a little more exciting than this basic one here. Um, you've got the same challenges that uh, you have with nightscapes. You've got the focus and the dew control. Uh, and then there's another little trick uh, you need to know about. Um, if your, your camera lens is going to stop down every time you take a picture, if you've got a DSLR, right? So it's going to be wide open so you can see through it. And then when you press the shutter, it's going to stop down to whatever you have it set at. And the problem is, is that it doesn't go to exactly the same diameter every time. So what happens when you stack up thousands of those is you can get flicker. So one of the tricks of the trade, and it sounds a little scary, but you can uh, uh, release your lens from the camera and rotate it just enough so that the electrical contacts are, are you know, turn it into a manual lens. But, you know, you don't want to go too far because it'll fall out. But you know, that's, that's one trick that uh, he talks about. And then there's some other things that he has to, to sort of de-flicker. But again, a manual lens would be an advantage in that case because it's not going to have that, that flicker problem. No, the, the, it's not vibration that we're talking about. It's the fact that, you know, when you... Assuming you're, you're sh not shooting at your widest aperture, which you might do to, to get sharper stars or something, you know, sometimes lenses, it's hard to get really sharp focus wide open, so you might go down a stop or two. Um, so, yeah, every time you take a picture, it's going to stop down, and it, it just doesn't go to the exact same... It's a mechanical limit. It's a mechanical thing, yeah, yeah. Um, so at this point... Uh, you know, you might want to consider tethered shooting versus like an intervalometer, and that means connected to a, a laptop. That's what we're going to be doing tonight with the telescope. Um, and there's some software called Backyard EOS or Backyard Nikon that I recommend. It's about 50 bucks for the, for the pro version, which I recommend. Um, so either Canon or, or Nikon, and uh, I'll be demonstrating that later later tonight okay uh, so we talked about a tracker so then yeah the next piece of hardware would be this is the the least expensive way to track the stars as they move across the sky so um, they come in different you know brand names the, the iopteron has a sky tracker uh, there's another one called polari and there's uh, other ones that look completely different but do the same thing. Um, and basically they're battery powered and they're going to, uh, you know, rotate with the sky. And uh, you just have to get them aligned like, just like these more sophisticated mounts, you have to get them aligned perfectly with True North in order for them to track properly. So these are, the, again, the least expensive type of of mounts to do that. They're limited in the weight they can carry, uh, but this allows you to take longer exposures. You're not going to be limited by that rule of 500 we'll talk about in a little bit, because uh, you'll, you'll be tracking the stars so you won't get star trails. Uh, again, the same challenges is to focus and do control, um, but at this point you might start, uh, since you're tracking the stars, you, you could use software to, to stack multiple exposures to get more detail uh, in, a, in a picture. Um, so this image here 
if you recognize again the Great Nebula in Orion, M42, M43, the Flame Nebula, the horse heads right there. So that's uh, uh, you know a, a, a single shot with a 400 millimeter lens on one of these trackers. What else do I need to cover here? Um, they usually don't come with everything you need, unfortunately. Well, you need a tripod uh, and a good, steady, uh, professional tripod. And then you're going to need a ball head uh, to attach because they, they come usually without one. And you, you need that to be able to point your camera wherever you want as it tracks. OK. Uh, one thing that you might get into as you start to put longer lenses or telescopes on your camera is you're going to have difficulty in pointing it at objects, getting on the, on the target. Uh, so one thing you can do is uh, get a hot shoe adapter and put, put a uh, telescope finder or red dot finder or something uh, on there and uh, align those during the day like point your camera at a radio tower or electrical tower or something and get the red dot lined up with the camera and then at night uh, you'll be able to point the red dot at uh, your target and then your camera will be pointed in the right direction. Okay. So then the next thing, again, as we increase the, the length of the lens or the telescope, uh, I would call it wide field. So this is kind of a crazy color example of uh, the heart nebula and the soul nebula. And uh, I did this by piggybacking. Here's a DSLR and, a, and that 400 millimeter lens again. Or actually, no, I'm sorry, this is 150, I think, this time, right? T3, 150, yeah, to, to make it wider field. And uh, this is just piggyback on, on a telescope that's already tracking the sky. And it, at this point, uh, this was my home rig a little while ago. I had two uh, telescopes with a color and a monochrome camera on there. So, let's see. Um, so now we're starting to talk about, you know, a regular telescope mount. So for astrophotography, you need what's called a German equatorial mount, not an alt-as mount or a fork mount. And this is because you, you need to track the stars and, and the alt-as mounts will, will, while they can track, the, the image will rotate as they track. And you don't want that, right? You want your, everything to stay the same. Um, so German equatorial mounts, you know, they have a, what's called the right ascension axis that rotates uh, pointed towards true north, and then in declination they go, the, go this way. Um, okay, so that's wide field, and then we get into planetary. So planets are very, very bright compared to everything else in the, in the sky. And they're also very small. And that leads to kind of needing different telescopes for planetary versus everything else. I mean, you can, you know, use the same telescope. But as far as optimizing things, um, there's some kind of opposites. So for planetary, you want a lot of magnification, uh, which leads to high focal numbers. You know, like uh, for instance, where's uh, Lick Observatory? It's over here. Can't see it without lights on it. There it is. Um, so they have their big camera that was uh, their big telescope, biggest telescope that they have that was made in 1959. Uh, they have three different camera positions. When they're doing planetary, there's a tunnel that goes down into the basement with the camera way at the end, and it's an F39 uh, at that point. And uh, so a higher F number is going to give you a, a better view of, of planets, whereas if we're doing nebulas, 
you know, we're probably using focal reducers and trying to get down to F5 or F4 or something. Um, so different, different uh, hardware and also different uh, techniques. So again, we'll talk about in a minute, the deep space taking multiple exposures uh, of objects to try to bring them out because they're so faint. With, with planetary, we're actually going to be taking like video. We're going to take as many frames as we can, as fast as we can, and we're going to use a technique called lucky imaging. So, the, you know, the atmosphere is going like this, and you look at the moon through a telescope, and it's wavy, right? So by taking all these rapid photos, uh, the software is going to go through and figure out which piece of which photo is sharply in focus and then start putting that all together to give you a nice uh, image. So in the case of DSLRs, we use uh, Live View uh, and the Backyard EOS, Backyard Nikon does all that for you. Um, and the software, there's some free software called Registax and there's some others that you use then to, to do that lucky imaging. Okay. So now we're to my favorite stuff, uh, deep sky. It's the most complicated. <laughs> uh, it takes the most gear, hardware, software. It, it, it takes kind of expensive gear. Uh, and things are very sensitive. Uh, you know, you're dealing with arc seconds. So, you know, there's 60 degrees in a, in a circle. There's 60 arc minutes in a degree, and there's 60 arc seconds in an arc minute. So what, what does that mean? Well, if you take a golf ball and you put it five miles out, that's about an arc second. And so you're trying to, to track things that accurately. And so you can kind of get a sense of why the gear can be expensive to have that kind of accuracy. Um, these are a couple things that, that I imaged. Remember I told you about the thing looks like a big eye? That's the Helix Nebula, and this is a, a galaxy. Uh, and uh, I took these with this robotic telescope. I believe that one's also in Australia. And uh, so, yeah, you can also, that's one uh, technique you can use to avoid spending, you know, thousands and thousands of dollars on on gear is you can you can rent robotic telescopes to uh, to do it over the internet for you um, so at this point you need a bunch of different pieces of hardware and software to work together you're going to have a planetarium program you're going to have a mount driver you might have autofocus uh, image capture Plate solving means figuring out where in the sky you are and correcting uh, where you are. Uh, and then at some point you might want to automate all of that so that you can go to sleep and your scope just sits there and does everything for you while you sleep. Um, so again, I'll be demonstrating a lot of that tonight and um, you know, I have other presentations on YouTube uh, that talk about the ins and outs of that. So we talked about prime lenses and zoom lenses. Um, you know, this goes into a little more detail on the on the difference. Uh, so here you go, uh, BEH, KEH, and uh, Adorama, Andorama, however you pronounce it. So there's your there's your list. Um, yeah. So again, just you're going to get more bang for your buck with the used prime lenses. You get more aperture, and you don't need all the autofocus and all that stuff to do nighttime. In terms of focal length, uh, here's some examples. Uh, so here's a Milky Way shot and uh, they're, they're listing the lengths, focal lengths with a, a crop sensor and a full frame. And so you can see what a 50 millimeter lens would do, 24, 16, 12 millimeter, 8 millimeter. Uh, you know, so you get a sense, and then we go on out into space. Uh, here's the 150 millimeter. Right here in the center, again, is the, the uh, M42 and M43, and the horse head over here. 
so here's 150 millimeter, 300, 400, 500, and then 1,000. Uh, and so most of these telescopes are in the 1,000 millimeter class. And the reason it doesn't look like it's 1,000 millimeters long is because the light goes through there th uh, three times before it gets to the camera, right? So it comes in, hits a primary mirror, hits a secondary mirror, and then goes down to the, to the camera. So this is max plus telescope? Well, this is, this is uh, an old beat-up uh, eight-inch uh, Schmidt Cassegrain. Um, so, yeah. All right, so how do you focus? So without any other aids, the first thing you want to do is take advantage of your, your LCD. So go on the back of your camera and turn that thing on and zoom all the way in. They usually have like a 10x, a 5x, and a 10x zoom. Go to 10x, and then some people even carry a little plastic uh, magnifying glass on top of that. And that'll help you, you know, first find a bright star, some, you know, the brighter the better. And then you're, you're trying to get the star as small as possible, okay? Um, then, depending on, your, on how your lens works, uh, once you get in focus, you might be, there might be an autofocus switch or something that you could then lock the focus with. Uh, or you could uh, put some painter's tape or something so it doesn't, doesn't get bumped. Um, the other thing that you can do is uh, um, in software they have uh, aids that will, you know, zoom in. This is tethered shooting again, so you can zoom in. Uh, and again, it takes a pretty bright star uh, to see that. And then you can, they'll give you a number here and you can try to make the number as small as possible as you focus. And then I think on the next slide we'll talk about these Batonoff masks. Um, so here's one for this scope because it has a, a secondary that it has to sit over. But these things create a diffraction pattern in the stars. And I believe the next slide talks about it. Um, so that was one for a telescope. And then, you know, they have ones for lenses that are small. But these ones that are thick like this, they don't really work that great. And I found this... Uh, Sharp Star 2 by Lonely Spec is a laser etched on a filter, uh, and that works really well. Um, and I think I have some examples here. So let me go back to t tell you what you're looking for here. So if you look down here, it's hard to do. I don't have enough fingers, but let, let's say <laughs> there's spikes like this on the star, right? Okay, and those are always going to, if the star is anywhere near in focus, you're going to see that. And then there's, as you get close to focus, there'll be another line in the middle. And you, your job, it'll move back and forth as you come in and out of focus. And your job is just to put it right in the middle. So, you know, when it looks like this, that's in focus. And then you take the mask off and you're, and you're ready to go. So, here's... The first time I used that uh, fast star, you can see all the all the little stars now have this this uh, diffraction pattern, and uh, the bright ones are are bigger. And then you can use that to get in focus. Okay, so here's an in focus with the sharp star. And then they have uh, different ones for, for different uh, lens sizes and whatnot. What, what I did was uh, I figured out what my biggest uh, lens was uh, in terms of the filter size. And I got a filter holder for that. And then I have step-down rings for all the other lenses. And I got a 85 millimeter uh, sharp star. And it, it pretty much is going to work across all of the the lens uh, links that I that I have okay we talked about the the rule of 500 this is for determining how long can you expose before you have star trails 
So the way this works is called the rule of 500 because it's 500 divided by the focal length of your lens. Uh, and that gives you a, a number in seconds that's how long you can expose without star trails. Now that's for a full frame camera. Uh, so it's a little more complicated for crop sensors. Uh, as you know, the, the ratios are 1.5 or 1.6 for, for crop sensors depending on the brand. So you multiply the focal length by that first and then do the, the uh, 500 divided by that number and uh, that'll tell you what your maximum exposure without star trails is and then basically your control at that point is, is uh, ISO up or down to, to make that exposure work for you. And speaking of exposure, uh, so ha have you heard of exposed to the right in daytime photography? So if you look at the histogram, this is, this is how it looks in backyard EOS. Uh, it's similar to what you see on the back of your camera. Um, basically, when, when you're doing stuff at night, you, you have a little different histogram than what you're going to see during the day. You usually have just this one spike. And your job is to make sure there's a gap over here on the left. And that's making sure that you're exposing above the background. Uh, and, you know, if you see uh, anything piled up over here, then you're, then you're overexposing and you're clipping data. You know, your stars are, are uh, going to be smacked up against the, the right-hand side. Um, so basically, you want this one spike to be kind of in the first third of your histogram and you want some space there and that's all you have to worry about. Okay, so we can have long and somewhat religious or political discussions about what ISO uh, to use, but, but basically, um, you know, use whatever ISO you need to get the shot first and then, you know, if you can, uh, turn it down. Uh, because you're, you're tracking or whatever it is, then, then great. Um, but, you know, as long as you expose above the, the sky glow and you have pinpoint stars with no, no jiggly stars because you're, you're tracking, uh, then you can deal with, with ISO noise in software to a, to a certain extent. Um, I usually shoot the DSLRs uh, at 1600. I know other people do 800 or even 400, but uh, I usually do, do 16 at night. Uh, and uh, also, don't take advantage of the higher ISO settings for things like uh, focusing or getting on target or whatever, um, or determining exposure. For instance, um, you know, let's. I usually take uh, eight-minute exposures on the on my telescope with the DSLRs. So I don't want to take an eight-minute exposure to see if eight minutes is long enough or not, because it's just a waste of time. So what I do is I turn uh, Canon T3i. The highest ISO is 12,800. So I'll do you know a 60-second uh, exposure at that ISO and uh, see what the histogram looks like. And if it looks good, then I know that I can just multiply that uh, times 8 because 1280 is, is uh, two ISO, oh, let's see, one, two, three ISO stops away from 1600. So every time you go down an ISO stop, you're, you're doubling the time, right? So, uh, so it's 2 times 2 times 2 is uh, is your eight two cubed okay so that gives you your 480 seconds or your your eight minutes um, so that's how you can save time estimating your exposure and I can't see my keys anymore so there's a bunch of other camera settings uh, in your menus uh, you know, so you want to be in manual mode, you want manual focus, you want to shoot raw, uh, and you want to turn off long exposure noise reduction. What long exposure noise reduction does is it's going to take 
let's say you've got your doing this eight minute exp exposure you know it's going to expose for eight minutes and then it's going to take another eight minutes with the shutter closed and subtract the two to try to get rid of the noise well we're going to do all that in software later and we're going to shoot our our dark frames with the camera in a camera bag in the refrigerator or something to get it to the same temperature that it was at night rather than use up our valuable nighttime to take these darks and and subtract them so we want to turn off the noise in camera noise reduction uh, and then we're going to be using you know either a intervalometer or connected to a to a computer and here's a a chart of more things that you want to think about when you're uh, look getting your camera ready to, to shoot at night so we talked about dew control so uh, you know these telescopes have uh, dew heaters that you attach but here's kind of a poor man's dew control is uh, just hand warmers and you can put them on there with painters tape or something or there's this one guy that sells these lens muffs uh, that I've used and uh, probably don't need three hand warmers unless it's really cold but uh, I use two or one he used to sell these hats too, and I guess he stopped selling them. I really like this particular hat. Um, so it's got uh, red down, and it's got uh, white down and white out front and everything, and um, it's kind of nice. Because I used to have, uh, even I had a, a flashlight with uh, white and red, and the white knob was smooth and the red knob was knurled but I still kept hitting the wrong one and people would get mad at me you know turn that light off ah. so this is uh, this is pretty cool because they're separate switches so <coughs> reds on the right it's pretty hard to mess up Mary <coughs> the lady here tonight Mary uh, has found another source for these <clears throat> okay so that's pretty much it uh, there's some just some charts here at the end that kind of summarize everything um, yeah so I have a YouTube channel uh, and we have lectures uh, speakers guest speakers every month at uh, Hoagie Park and then uh, everything that's public is on uh, meetup Questions? So uh, I use Photoshop to post process, and there's a ton of uh, techniques, uh, levels, and curves, and all kinds of things. Uh, it's a whole, whole nother topic. Well, yeah, we track and we stack and then we go into Photoshop. And uh, there's another uh, program that's becoming very popular that I haven't taken the jump into, but a lot, most uh, astrophotographers now are using something called PixInsight. But even some of the best uh, still kind of jump back into Photoshop on occasion to do certain operations in Photoshop. But I haven't made that PixInsight. Yeah, so it's kind of a, it's a very um, mathematical and, and everything's a list of procedures. It's, it's, it's not, <laughs> it's, it's very different from Photoshop. Let me just put it, put it that way. Um, so you can, I'm sure you can find uh, lots of things online, both about Photoshop processing and uh, PixInsight. Uh, I did, uh, I started this by mentioning on, on Tuesday, uh, uh, Last week I gave a, a presentation that had some Photoshop techniques in it, and that's on, on my YouTube channel. I don't consider myself a super amazing uh, processing person. There's lots of resources out there, and you can kind of pick the methods. But uh, it, it talks about that lecture talks about uh, some, some actions you can get and some plugins you can get that, that help with astro processing. Okay? Any other questions? So, uh, you talked about ISO and uh, exposure. 
Yes. So, um, generally you're going to be opening things up as, as wide as you can unless uh, you find that stopping down a stop or two gives you sharper stars. So it just depends on your, on your lens, but uh, gen generally more aperture is better, yeah. I'm sorry? Nothing. Okay. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to turn the car off, and uh, I can't tell with this bright screen if we can see Polaris yet or not. But uh, yeah, I think it's up there. okay. So the first step for those of us that have uh, German equatorial mounts will be to get lined up on on Polaris and get our mounts uh, aligned, and then we can demo some. Hopefully, if the if it's not too hazy. Uh, we can demonstrate some some actual deep space photography here so thanks for listening